Okay, so uh, chapter 14, this is probably going to be a, a little bit shorter than previous chapters, which isn't too bad given we've got a slightly shorter week uh, and you took a test on Tuesday. Um, so what we're covering here in chapter 14 is the evolution of genes and genomes. We've been speaking about how organisms evolve, but by the same token, the their genomes and the genes that comprise them also change over time and are subject to selection. So these are the, the fundamental units of evolutionary change, and it's important that we understand how those change over time. The complexity of an organism, uh, right? You are more complex than the trees that you might see outside your window or the bacteria that live inside your gut. But the complexity of the organism isn't necessarily correlated with the size of their genome or the number of genes that they have. Um, and this is made quite clear in the introductory page of this chapter in which they discuss the fact that the genome of a pine tree that's outside that's probably coating your automobile in pollen is about six times the size of your genome. And that a small nematode, a small worm, with only about a thousand cells has the same number of genes that you do and that the wheat that is used to make the bread you eat they have many many times more genes than you have something on the order of six times the number of genes that you have so your complexity and size has nothing to do with how large your genome is or how many genes you have and You'll note that it doesn't matter how big your genome is, that doesn't determine how many genes you have either. So you can have lots of genes in a small genome or a large genome with very few genes, or you can have lots of genes or very few genes in the very same size genome. So there's really a lot of variation in these numbers. So what we're going to be focusing on in this chapter is how do genes originate, how do they change, and how do they evolve? So this uh, figure 14.1 from your text just focuses on genome size across various organisms. And I want you to recognize that the x-axis of this is a uh, is based on how many millions of base pairs these organisms have. So the one right under that bird's rear end is one million bases, okay? That's a relatively small genome, okay? So, but birds don't have a genome, birds, mammals, reptiles don't have genomes that are one million bases. You'll notice that purple bar is between the 10 to the three and 10 to the four. So 10 to the third is tens, hundreds, thousands. So it's a thousand million base pairs. So one billion base pairs. Okay. So a bird, mammal, or reptile genome can be expected to be somewhere in the neighborhood of one to 10 billion base pairs. But look at these other organisms that you might view as being inferior to your own complexity and um, evolutionary state, right? A fungus, a plant, a Fly, uh, a fruit fly could have a larger genome than you, okay? So just make sure that you understand that genome size is high, highly variable and not necessarily correlated with what we perceive to be as the complexity of the organism. And as you think about what is all of this genetic material, what are all these billions of nucleotides within our genome and the genome of the pine tree outside, realize that there are a lot of different categories of gene regions and non-gene regions in the genome. Some of these things are protein coding gene regions. They are exons that are transcribed and translated. But you'll notice here that for humans, that represents less than 2% or right about 2% of the genome. A far larger proportion, 26% of our genome are introns, things that are not transcribed and translated. And then there are all these other categories of things, miscellaneous unique sequences, transposons, signs, lines. These are 
short, repeated sequences that don't really seem to do a whole lot. Okay, so I want you to keep in mind that we're going to be talking about the evolution of genomes, and you might wonder why the genome of a pine tree is six times as large as yours. It's probably not because that red slice of the pie is large, six times larger than yours. It's got a lot of the other things that are not red in this pie that it has more of. And those don't necessarily mean that it can produce more unique proteins uh, or that it's more genetically complex than you are. It simply has more nucleotides. So what are all of these nucleotides and what are the ones that we're most interested in, the ones that actually contribute to our phenotype? Well, of course, most of those are involved in the regulation uh, of transcription of particular genes, or they are the genes themselves. And so it's important to remember when we think about a gene, we're talking about this coding region, the exons and the introns, and you should remember what those are. Those are the things that are transcribed, translated, and turned into protein. We're also um, going to be talking a bit about the promoters, uh, the, the sequences on the, at the beginning, at the end of genes that regulate whether or not that gene is transcribed or translated. So when we're talking about genes, just keep this in mind. You've got a lot of background knowledge that you're carrying forward into these lectures on the evolution of genes and genomes. Things like codons, codon positions, um, regulation of transcription, processing of messenger RNA molecules. Okay, understanding these things, these foundational concepts that you've learned before you got into evolution and we might have spoken about earlier in the semester will be kind of important as we go through this lecture. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, with respect to the bread wheat, um, the number of genes within organisms is highly variable. And in some cases, it's highly variable even among very closely related organisms. So you can see here in the three plants that are represented, these, so there's a phylogeny on the far left and these horizontal bars represent how many genes they have. Rice, have somewhere in the order of 60,000 genes, more than twice as much as the other two plants listed here, okay? And certainly more than you have. You can see you are down at the bottom there. You've got about 20,000 genes. So the rice you eat has three times as many protein coding genes as you do, okay? Now, does that mean that they can produce more than three times as many proteins as you? No, there's something you've learned about before that the number of genes is not necessarily equal to the number of distinct proteins you can make. And that's alternative splicing. That comes up again later in this chapter, but it's something you've learned before. Now notice within animals, there's also quite a bit of variation in the number of genes, especially the puffer fish, uh, fugu, have an enormous number of genes for an animal. Okay, so, how do we end up with different numbers of genes? How do species evolve different numbers of genes? Why would one fish have more genes than another fish? Why would one plant have more genes than another plant? Well, that's really where this chapter starts to get interesting and dig into things that you might not have thought about in this much detail in the past. So there are three ways that we're gonna talk about genes duplicating or increasing in number within a biological organism, within a lineage, okay? So the first way that we can, uh, or that we're gonna talk about uh, genes duplicating or increasing in number is through this process of unequal crossing over. So an unequal crossing over, these are homologous chromosomes that line up next to one another in meiosis one. Okay, so what we're seeing here is a blue chromosome and an orange chromosome lining up in meiosis one and they get a bit tangled up on that metaphase one plate. Okay, now you'll notice that the orange and the blue versions of this chromosome have the same genes, A through F. And they interact, we've talked about crossing over before, but what you'll notice here is that <clears throat> 
where they are interacting is not exactly the same spot. So this crossover results in an unequal exchange of chromosome arms, such that on the right, chromosome 2 and chromosome 3 are significantly altered from where they used to be. You can see here how a chromosome could lose a gene, as uh, exemplified in chromosome 2 there. Or you can see how a gene might be duplicated. Okay, so in chromosome 3, there are two copies of gene C. This is a really important concept. Okay, so this is how different organisms can have different numbers of genes, or it's one of the ways that we can end up with different numbers of genes. Now, what you might say looking at this is, okay, yes, an individual that has chromosome number three has more genes, say they're homozygous for chromosome number three. They got that same one from both parents. That individual that's homozygous for chromosome three with two copies of C has three, six, seven genes on that chromosome. An individual homozygous for that chromosome two has only five, okay? So they have different numbers of genes, and that may affect the organism over time. They may evolve. That may be beneficial. It may be detrimental. But what I want you to realize is those two copies of C don't necessarily stay the same thing forever, and that's where things get really interesting, okay? All right. So this was the first way in which we might get the duplication of genes. The second mechanism, other than unequal crossing over, is replication slippage. Okay, so what replication slippage is, is when you are making a new strand of DNA, when DNA replication is happening, something you've learned about before, if the template strand has a loop or a fold in it, as you see on the left, the middle left, the nascent strand, the new one that's being made, it's being made left or right, when it's copying that thick black region, it misses some of it because the template strand had that little bubble formed in it, okay? Now, on the right side, you'll see something similar can happen where the nascent strand has a fold and um, it can actually uh, add some extra nucleotides that aren't supposed to be there. So what you might end up with on the left side is you could have a deletion of a region, okay? You'll see what happened here is we end up with losing some of what was in the very first piece, okay? What happened in the bottom right side is instead of losing, going from two of these black regions, now we've got three, okay? Because the new strand that's being made contains more than it ought to. So, I encourage you to Google. I tried to look for a bunch of replication slippage images. Some of them are way too complex. Some of them are um, just terrible images. This shows it reasonably well, but you might better envision, especially the loops. These don't look so much like loops to me. Uh, some of the loops do look better on other images, but I found those other images to be terribly uh, poor in their organization or resolution, but it might be helpful for you to review how you can go from two copies of something, okay, these two direct repeat regions, to having only one or having three. So this is how we can end up with more genes than we started with. And finally, the third way that genes can duplicate themselves or the genome can increase the number of genes that are in it. Okay, so... The duplicates that are created, and this is something I've talked about before, um, are free and may adopt new functions. Now, this is a principle reinforced by this figure 14.3 in your text, but I want you to think about, you know, so read this example in your text. It's a very interesting one with respect to crystalline uh, uh, protein structure that is in the eye of a number of different organisms. But I want you to sit back and reflect upon a critically important gene that your body has, okay? You need this gene in order to do certain things. You have to produce a very specific protein that is required for life, okay? 
What if you had a mutation to that gene? Do you think that mutation is likely going to be good or bad for you? Are most random mutations good? No. I've given you the example before of me taking a hammer and randomly banging on things under your, the hood of your car. Okay, Random changes to complicated and highly organized systems rarely do good. Okay, So most random changes are bad. Now, what I want you to realize is that if I have only one copy of a very important gene and I suffer random changes to it, most of those are going to be bad, therefore selected against, and they will be removed from the population. Okay, So variation within critical genes is relatively rare. Okay, But if I have two copies of that gene, if the gene has been duplicated and I'm making sufficient quantities of the proper protein with one copy, the other copy is what I would characterize as a mutational freebie. Mutations can occur to it, and if they disable its function entirely, it doesn't end catastrophically for the organism bearing that mutation. Okay, They have this mutation to a free copy, and that copy is uh, able to withstand multiple mutations that could sometime down the road end up being beneficial. Okay. So, do we have evidence of the impact of these types of gene duplications uh, on populations within species? Well, in fact, we do, and the text presents a very compelling example from humans here. Um, with gene AMY1, it's a protein that breaks down starch. It's uh, present in the saliva of humans. What's interesting is that this is not a gene that has a fixed number of gene copies in humans. Okay, So what's interesting is the more copies of it you have, the more of it you make. And that makes sense, right? You can imagine how if your cells begin expressing gene AMY1, if you have one copy of it, you will produce X amount. If you have 10 copies of it and you're expressing that gene, that process of expression of that gene in your cell, there's nothing regulating whether we're only going to express one of these copies, not all 10. If expression begins, all 10 will be expressed and presumably you would therefore have 10 times as much uh, of this salivary protein. Now, where is that useful? What's interesting is they've compared human populations that consume lots of starch and human populations that don't consume very much starch at all. So you can see in this graph, in the bottom left, populations that consume high quantities of starch. In this case, it's populations from Japan where they eat a lot of rice, you can see that the, the distribution of those blue bars, most individuals in the population have quite a few copies of this AMY1 gene. Contrast that with this Biaka population of uh, African peoples that have a diet that is primarily protein-based. They don't eat as much starch. They have, if you look at the average of that distribution, they have an average far fewer copies of this AMY1 gene. Okay, And the, the images on the right, uh, figure B here, are interesting in that they are actual photographs of the dye-labeled gene regions on the chromosome. So the AMY1 chromosome is stained and it stains, you know, part of it stains green and part of it stains red. And so in Biaka, this is one individual where you can see that one of their chromosomes, the very top image, has one, two, three copies. Their other chromosome also has three copies. So in total, they have six copies of this gene. Okay. However, this Japanese individual, look at first, let's look at the very bottom image. They have one, two, three, four copies of the gene, but their chromosome in that top image they have 10 copies of the gene in that chromosome. So in all, they have 14 copies of the AMY1 gene. 
which is remarkable. They're going to have much higher expression of this AMY1 salivary protein. They're going to be much better uh, at breaking down starch and extracting resources from the food items that they're consuming. So gene number, gene copy number varies not only among species, but also, also within species, okay? And you can see that this Japanese population, as their starch consumption has increased over many, many generations, we have a significantly higher production of this protein, okay? Because selection has led to the increased frequency of high copy numbers for the AMY1 protein. Okay, now in your text, they then discuss how much gene duplication and deletion influences genetic differentiation among species. And you can see here in a tree of mammals, the number of uh, genes that have either increased or decreased. So negative is a loss of a gene, positive is in, uh, addition or duplication of a gene. You can see there's a pretty big difference between some of these species that are very closely related. Mouse and rats, humans and chimpanzees, these numbers are pretty large. And you might have heard in the past uh, about how genetically similar some of these organisms are. So for example, you know, I and a chimpanzee differ in a very small percentage of our genome. Most of it's identical, okay? A very small percentage of that uh, genome between us differs, but the vast majority of that difference is not due to changes of an A to a T here or a G to a C there. They are changes in the number of genes or the presence of certain gene copies. So recognize that the evolution of the genome at the scale of gene duplication and deletion is the primary driver of genetic differentiation among species. And as I mentioned, these duplicate copies of genes, as I said, they're mutational freebies. The text pre presents this example of this primate that is somewhat unusual in that it eats uh, vegetation that it needs to ferment in its gut. That's uncommon. Not many uh, primates do this. Okay, that's something that you might think of cows doing, right? They're constantly chewing on the uh, grasses that they eat and they rely on this fermentation in their gut to get the resources out of it. What's interesting is this species of primate is able to do that because of this gene duplication event to an RNase 1 gene. So this, you can see that in this phylogeny down at the bottom, there these two top branches are both Dwok Langers. Okay. But what's interesting is, unlike rhesus monkeys or humans, the Dwok Langers have two copies of this RNase 1 gene. And one of the copies, the bottom one there, has had no mutations, no changes, non-synonymous or synonymous. There, that copy of the RNAs1 gene is identical to yours and mine, okay? But what's interesting is that this B copy, this second copy, has three, six, nine, 12 mutations, okay? So there are 12 differences between their RNAs1 and RNAs1B gene versions, which is an enormous number of mutations considering that there are no differences between the three RNAs1 versions of the rhesus, the langer, and the human here, okay? And what's even more amazing is that of these 12 mutations, nine of them are non-synonymous and three of them are synonymous, okay? And that is what's represented in this red box, the DNDS ratio, the number of non-synonymous mutations or changes, divided by the number of synonymous changes. So that's nine to three in this example, okay? So what's quite remarkable is the higher number of non-synonymous changes, okay? Now, generally, 
if you think about mutations, mutations are random. So if you think about random mutations throughout the genome, are mutations more likely to hit a nucleotide site that is synonymous or non-synonymous? They're just as they're equally likely to hit anywhere. Okay. Now within a coding region of a gene, you might see because of what you're looking at, it's specifically a coding region of a gene. Most of those sites, codon position one, codon position two, are non-synonymous changes. So because two thirds of those nucleotide sites are probably going to be non-synonymous, you'd expect there to be more non-synonymous changes within a coding region just because of what it is. But what's amazing is, remember, most of those are going to be bad and weeded out, okay? So what we actually see for the most part, most often, is we see lots of synonymous changes, not that many non-synonymous that stick around. What this is telling us, that there are more non-synonymous changes, is telling us that these nine changes are good. They are important. They are helpful and enable this species to utilize this RNase-1B protein in order to do something that it was not able to do before. It's beneficial. It tells us this locus has been under selection. And this DNDS ratio being larger than one is exactly what tells us that selection has taken place on this locus. Now, this is covered later in the chapter on page 355. I encourage you to review DNDS ratios and ha have a solid understanding of what that means and why when we look at a, a locus and find that there are more non-synonymous than synonymous changes, that tells us that the, the gene, the locus has been selected upon. Okay. Uh, so we see evidence of duplication in our genome here in the protein that is responsible for the depolarization of our neurons. This sodium channel protein spans our neural membranes, neural cell membranes, okay, and consists of four repeated elements that have identical, largely identical regions that span the uh, cellular membrane, okay. On the right, you'll see a bacterial uh, transmembrane protein that does the same thing. And you'll notice that it's but a single six region protein unit. That's because the protein that we produce on the left has been, was a single way back when, not in humans, but way back before humans, there was a single uh, region that was, and that gene was subject to a gene duplication. So you went from having, having one, uh, one piece, one transmembrane or one membrane spanning piece that was duplicated. Then you had two, and then the whole thing was duplicated again. So you go from having two to four. So for this reason, our sodium channel proteins have four domains that serve the same function. And this is due entirely to the duplication of gene. Now, this gene duplication and evolution of the genome can get far more complex than this. And this is illustrated in figure 14.8, and that's it's explained in the text. It's a pretty remarkable example in which two genes kind of become mixed up with one another. And so the ADH locus uh, has been retrotransposed into the YMP gene. So these are two different genes, ADH and YMP. So you'll see in the middle here, YMP consists of these, these light green exons, and there are a bunch of introns, right? The introns are the lighter blue. So what you see has happened is ADH has jumped into YMP. And where did it jump into YMP? It jumped right into the third intron, that third light blue space. Okay, now a couple of things that you should note here. 
One of the things is, this is a retro transposition. So does that mean that the original copy of the ADH gene has been cut out of its original chromosome and stuck here? Is that how retro transposition works? No. Remember, what happens in retro transposition is that an RNA molecule is reverse transcribed and that reverse transcript is stuck into a different place. And that is exactly why this pink region in the middle has no introns, right? The ADH locus still exists somewhere, but this retrotransposed copy has now been stuck into intron 3 of the YMP gene, okay? That changes the YMP gene quite dramatically, in part because you'll notice the ADH locus, when retrotransposed, brought with it a new stop codon. Because, of course, the stop codon is at the end of that messenger RNA molecule that was retrotransposed or re retrotranscribed into DNA. And that stop codon DNA was stuck in with the ADH gene into the middle of YMP. And so over time, what happens is these exons downstream of the stop codon, they degenerate. How do they degenerate? They don't just fall apart or dissolve. But what happens is there is no longer selection that favors or maintains the integrity of those exons. Are they ever going to be expressed again? No, never. Okay, That stop codon ends any translation of the RNA molecule that is made through the transcription of this YMP locus that is now um, called the Jingwei locus. Okay. So this is a, a really interesting example that's been observed in fruit flies that illustrates how complex the evolution of genomes really can be. Now, I want to jump back to something that we talked about back in chapter nine. I want you to remember that breeding between species can move alleles and gene copies and genes that never existed in a species they can be introduced to that species through the process of introgression, okay? So we talked about introgression as bringing loci into a species that they can then utilize uh, and evolve with. Um, this, this is also called horizontal gene transfer. So when we're not really thinking from the perspective of this animal bred with that one, when we're thinking just about this animal has a gene that it got from something else. Sometimes we'll use, instead of introgression, the term horizontal gene transfer. This can really accelerate or change um, the evolutionary uh, future of a particular species. And I want to point out, and the text touches on this, this has enormous implications for medicine. Not because butterflies can, uh, through the process of HGT, change their colors. The reason that this is critically important for medicine is because uh, bacterial organisms, pathogens, while they uh, generally replicate through simply asexual means, they can also exchange genetic material with one another. And how bad will it be or is it when a, a bacterial species that is resistant to antibiotics passes that antibiotic resistance allele onto another species of bacterium or some other pathogen that then itself becomes resistant to that same antibiotic? This happens all the time and is an incredibly important uh, aspect of the treatment of infectious diseases. Okay, so when we have these types of uh, changes to the genome, large-scale changes, like these duplications, what is their fate? Well, as you might expect, the fate of most mutations is not great. It's uh, generally those are going to be lost, okay? Uh, this is an interesting graph that pr will probably take you a few minutes uh, looking at to kind of think about what it's actually showing and if we think about time running from left to right, we start at the left, 
we have a single copy of gene A. It may be that there's a duplication event here, just a little, about a centimeter over from, uh, or a little bit over from the far left side of the graph. There's a duplication event. You end up with two copies of A. But that chromosome that has that duplication may increase in frequency and then peter out and disappear from the population. Later in time, you might have another duplication. And for some reason, this one increases in frequency and reaches fixation. So now the entire uh, horizontal graph is this light, or I would say, teal color. Okay, it's kind of a greenish blue. So now we have two copies of gene A. And there's a mutation here, a deletion okay, of one of those copies. And that increases in frequency a bit and peters out and disappears. And then what we have, this neo on the very bottom that happens. So this point, red point, neo, talk about what that is in a minute, increases in frequency, reaches fixation. And what you end up with is instead of having two copies of A, we have undergone what is called neo-functionalization. And that word will show up on a slide in just a moment, so don't worry about spelling it. But what we have, we started out before that neo-functionalization, we had two copies of A. But after what the population has is an A and a B. Okay. So what you've just seen happen is this gene evolutionary change, okay? So these genes can mutate. These mutations might alter the function, okay? So what we're seeing before neo-functionalization happens, we're seeing duplicates arise. So look down at the bottom. Blue box, ancestral gene copy, becomes ancestral gene copy and new gene copy. There are two copies. They've been duplicated. And in the bottom right, you can see a figure where we've talked about this when we talked about uh, gene trees and phylogenetics. This is a figure from chapter two, where a gene alpha duplicated and there was an alpha and a beta version of that gene. Okay, we talked about this with respect to hemoglobin. Okay, what can happen with these duplicates? Well, the bullet points I have up there, you can have loss of function, okay, that one of the duplicates might lose its function, or it may retain its function. It may keep doing the same thing, okay, or there could be a mutation to it that completely breaks it. If I lose the function of one copy of a gene when I've got two, even if it's a critically important gene, it's not going to be a problem for me because I still have a functional copy. So the presence, the persistence of that uh, useless copy that has lost its function, we call that a pseudogene. It looks like the gene, but it's not a functional gene copy. It's not transcribed and translated. Okay, so uh, a, a gene copy that is no longer transcribed and translated is a pseudogene. Okay, so the the gene copy can either retain its function, as I've shown below in the blue boxes, or it can lose its function and become a pseudogene. Okay. But the, the, the other fate I want you to consider, and the one that was illustrated in the previous figure, in the previous slide, at the very far right, was this neo function. The principle of neo-functionalization is illustrated quite interestingly in this example from your text in that there are two groups of fishes here. Uh, the knife fishes, that's kind of the weird pointy one in the middle, and the loaches uh, towards the bottom with those dangly snouts and funky tails. These are both species of fish that have a unique organ, an electric organ, that allows them to communicate with one another via electrical currents, which is really remarkable. They're also able to navigate very turbid waters, so water that you can't see very far in. They can swim through these 
very dark, murky waters with lots of sediment, and they can find prey items using electrical signaling, which is quite remarkable. But what's interesting is those knife fishes in the middle there are from South America, and the Nathanemus towards the bottom are an African lineage of fishes. Both of these have evolved this electric capability due to the independent neo-functionalization of a sodium channel gene, okay? So they had a duplication event of the, a sodium channel gene, and then their sodium channel genes underwent mutation and selection that led to them being able to utilize these. Uh... Now, there's another term that the text introduces that I want you to be aware of, and that is the sub-functionalization, okay? And this is slightly different in that it is a, an instance where different gene copies don't necessarily do terribly different things, but they might be used at different times for different reasons. And the different versions of hemoglobin, uh, beta hemoglobin, that humans use is an example of this, okay? So unlike other mammals, humans utilize one version of beta hemoglobin before they're born and a different version after they're born. So you can see here these two different versions, the two red lines. One of them is very high uh, before birth and then declines rapidly. The other one is very low before birth and increases rapidly after birth. And that is because the version of this beta hemoglobin that is utilized uh, at, by human fetuses has much higher affinity for oxygen and basically what it's able to do when the baby's blood and the mother's blood are interacting, the baby is able to pull hemoglobin, or sorry, pull oxygen from the mother's hemoglobin to their own hemoglobin, okay? It wouldn't, that wouldn't be possible unless there were some greater affinity of the fetus's hemoglobin uh, for the oxygen than that of the mother. That is... Uh, hemoglobin is replaced after birth. And this is an example in which the two different gene copies have slightly, they basically do the same thing, but they're used at different times. This is sub-functionalization, a pretty remarkable uh, occurrence. Okay, so the rate of evolution of nucleotide sites. So selection acts on mutations that have a fitness effect. That makes sense, right? We've talked about how synonymous mutations are not going to be subject to selection. Uh, but most differences are in these non-coding regions. Why is that? Most differences between me and my cat, well, I don't own cats, my wife owns cats. Uh, me and my wife's cats, most of those differences are in non-coding regions because mutations to coding regions have fitness consequences and most of those consequences are negative. Again, the hammer in the engine example, okay? So most mutations that happen to coding regions are bad. Most mutations to non-coding regions, not so bad. So these are the ones that are going to persist in a population, okay? This is why, again, these observations of DNDS ratios greater than one are indicative of selection because those non-synonymous uh, substitutions, if they are occurring at a high frequency, are indicative of strong selective action on that locus. Okay, so keep this in mind. So when these mutations result in a change in function, that can result in a, a mutational change that will be under strong selection and can lead to evolution of the species. And this example from your text, they detail or they talk about this species of mosquito that is uh, a carrier for a number of diseases, including dengue fever, yellow fever, and chikungunya. Awful. It's a terrible. You don't want to have any of those things. Okay. 
What's interesting is they've found that there is a domestic form of this species and a forest form. The domestic forms appear to prefer to feed on humans, and the forest forms prefer to feed on wild animals. That makes sense, right? Uh, but how has this happened? Why, how, do, how do mosquitoes know that they should come after me rather than uh, an animal out in the wild? Well, it turns out that these genomic mutations have really changed the way in which these mosquito species go after their prey. So the, there's been a change in the function of the gene of domestic mosquitoes, okay? The way in which it works. There's been non-synonymous mutations that have been selected for uh, that lead to these domestic uh, variants of this mosquito species. They have a slightly different uh, protein that's produced, and they're that makes them attracted to a scent produced by humans and not other wild animals, okay? They also have a mutation to the expression of that gene, which is pretty remarkable. And not just everywhere, okay? They don't express that gene more everywhere. They express more of that gene that allows them to smell humans in their antenna which is where their sensory organs are that allow them to identify a potential food source. So not only did they change the function of the gene, the, the protein that it produces so that they are able to find humans better, they also changed where and how much it is expressed, greatly increasing their preference for humans. And that preference is illustrated in the graph on the bottom where the red bars represent collections of domestic populations of that mosquito and how, what percentage of those individuals or what was their preference for humans versus wild animals. And then they went out in the forest and collected a bunch of individuals. And what was the preference of those individuals for humans versus wild animals? And you can see here that there's a clear genetic difference between the domestic and the forest strains of this species due to mutations that change the gene function, but also the expression of those genes, okay? Now, one of the things I alluded to earlier in the uh, chapter is the number of genes, not necessarily reflecting the number of proteins that an organism might make or their genetic complexity. Remember, just because a pine tree has six times as many genes as you doesn't mean that they can make six times as many different proteins as you. And that's because of alternative splicing. You should remember from intro bio that alternative splicing is when processing uh, pre-mRNA that was produced through transcription. So the very top line here, you see the DNA. Second line, you see the pre-mRNA, okay, so it's the RNA transcript, it includes introns and exons. What you expect to see in the mRNA line is all the exons together with the introns cut out. But what you'll see here is that there are three different mRNAs that are produced by uh, expression of this one gene. This one gene has five exons, but depending on the circumstances within the cell, the post-transcriptional processing of this messenger RNA will lead to the inclusion of all five exons, or some of those exons may also be spliced out with the introns. So in the second one, you'll see that exon three is gone. In the third one, you'll see that exon four is gone. This results in three different proteins. So despite the fact that humans only have 20,000 genes, protein coding genes, we have more than 100,000 unique proteins that our bodies make because of this alternative splicing, okay? So what we haven't really dug into today is the evolution of things that affect splicing and alternative splicing, but that that's not really the point of this slide in the context of this lecture. The point of this is to remind you and bring home the fact that 
genome size and gene number are not indicative of genomic or genetic or biological complexity. And the towards the end of the chapter, the text gets into the num the proportion of the genome that is coding. Okay. So here you'll see on the x-axis how big is the genome. And on the y-axis, you'll see how much of that is actually coding. And you'll notice for the first uh, three quarters of this figure, all the bacteriophages, all the eukaryote DNA viruses, all the prokaryotes, most of the unicellular eukaryotes. What you see is there's a very straight line there. It's almost a one-to-one -one ratio. The genome size and the coding sequences, damn near the same size or a number of nucleotides. What that means is these bacteriophages and eukaryotes and prokaryotes, doesn't really matter how much DNA they have, they're using pretty much all of it uh, in coding sequences. But as you get up to unicellular eukaryotes, land plants and animals, you'll notice deviation from that 100% dashed line, okay? And there's a very quick transition from 100% to 10% to 1%. You see that? Those three dotted lines represent what proportion of the genome size is actually coding. When it's on that 100% dashed line, every damn bit of it is coding. You'll notice that most animals, it's on the south side of that 10% line. Less than 10% of their genomes are protein coding. Okay? And it ranges quite uh, widely. So there are some well below that 1%. There are some that are in that 50% range for animals and plants. Okay. So keep this in mind. Genome size has gotten quite large in many plants and animals, but that is not necessarily indicative of there being more and or larger protein coding genes. And some organisms that you wouldn't suspect have quite large genomes. So here on the top left is a lungfish whose genome is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30 times the size of yours. Okay, quite remarkable. The salamander on the bottom right here, this is a red salamander I found in my yard here in Oxford a couple weeks ago. His genome is about five times the size of yours. Again, after this is the reading that I've posted for you on Blackboard, and this uh, dives into the influence of a specific gene that has FOXP2 that has been mutated in humans. So there are mutations that are fixed in humans, not present in any other mammals, not present in any other primates. There's a high number of non-synonymous substitutions in this gene so the DNDS ratio is high, that are not found in other uh, primates. And these are linked to speech. And this is an interesting article that digs into when they take that human version of the gene and they stick it into mice, what happens? Okay, that's all.